Hey everybody, Susan here. We're just doing a quick mic check on our sound. Check, check, check. Everything's working good. And we'll be back in a little under two minutes. See you soon. morning my friends and welcome welcome i am susan smith we are in my studio stitched by susan and we're getting ready to quilt funny story for you guys yesterday i was quilting um i do have a computerized machine and so i had a quilt loaded and i thought oh i can quick get one more done before my live and unscripted episode right so i loaded it up yesterday afternoon and set it quilting and it was quite a dense design well about the worst thing for a computerized design happened, which is I got terrible tension on one whole pass and it began good. I had checked it, went about a quarter of the way and the rest of it was just awful. So I had to undo a 12 inch wide pass of dense quilting. So I was quilting for a long time last night. <laughs> but anyway, we're here this morning ready to do a much more low key type of design. So for those of you who are new, welcome. I'd love if you type in the chat window where you're watching from and maybe where you heard about this episode, so we can kind of gauge where to tell people about it. And I'll just chat for a few minutes while we wait for more people to join. And I'll tell you a little bit about why I do these live and unscripted episodes. So they are in real time. This is happening right now, although the replay will be up. So some of you may be watching a replay later down the road. Um, and this is being aired on YouTube. So if you find this valuable today, I encourage you to like and subscribe because then you'll get notifications whenever um, a new episode comes out. And I usually do these every second Monday morning. And the purpose of them is to just show a whole project in real time. I still remember the feeling as a beginning quilter of, you know, I go to load a quilt and there's just so many questions and I don't know what to decide about all these things. Should I load my backing, you know, top to bottom or can I turn it side to side? Or how do I keep my quilt straight? Or how do I know what thread to choose or what design to choose? How do I stop and start? Does it matter if I stop and start in the middle of the quilt? Like all these questions that you just don't know until you've done them, right? And of course you can't just take your long arm and go quilt with a buddy. And so it's difficult to learn these things just by quilting alongside someone. So that's the purpose of these episodes is I'm just welcoming you into my studio to watch me do a project. It's usually a client quilt. And so whatever challenges that quilt might have, that'll be part of that day's show. So it might be a quilt that has a lot of colors in it and it's tricky to choose a thread. It might be a quilt that's not very square and straight. And how do you deal with that? So whatever the day's project is, I'll just do it for you so you can see it being done in real time and I'll talk my way through some of the decisions that I make. So hopefully that will help you when you come to decisions in your own quilt. So we're going to do a project today from beginning to end. As you see, I have nothing on the long arm, so we'll be loading the backing, the batting, the quilt top, and quilting the whole thing. 
So I'm using what is called freehand edge to edge quilting. And if you're not familiar with those terms, freehand can mean a few things. It always means it's just guided. The machine is guided by hand. But for me in particular, it means um, quilting freely over an entire quilt top. So that is an edge to edge design. When you're not stopping for seams or blocks or borders or thread changes, you're just quilting the whole thing across, the same thing across the whole quilt top, that's edge to edge. And when I say I'm doing freehand edge to edge, I mean, I don't have a pattern or a pantograph or anything. I am literally doodling across the entire quilt top. So that's what we're gonna do today. And it's gonna be a kind of oak leafy sort of design. So heads up, if you always have trouble coming up with a sort of masculine design for the guys in your life, this is a great one to have in your back pocket. So let's see what else. Oh, coffee. I'm drinking coffee. Those of you who watch regularly know that I love my coffee. And if you are interested in supporting these episodes, they are free and they always will be. But you can go to buymeacoffee.com and for the price of one delicious coffee, five bucks, um, you can support this show. And so we're always trying to upgrade a little bit. We currently have three cameras running. They're all wired. Um, we're looking at upgrading our sound equipment and things like that. So it would just help us to keep producing these shows and to increase our quality as we learn. And when I say we, I mean my husband Dave and I, he's kind of behind the scenes. He's got a little bank of monitors and computers and hubs and wires and all this stuff going on. So he produces the show, couldn't do it without him. So we appreciate support that you offer and we appreciate you being here today. And also a shout out to my good friend, Dan Unger, whose guitar music you were hearing early on. And we may play it again when I get into kind of the boring bits of quilting, we'll have music going in the background. So that's my good friend, Dan on the guitar. So say hello in the comments and I'll take a minute to chat and say hi to folks here. And I have to take my glasses off to read the screen. Dana, seen you before. I finally made it for the live show. Woohoo! Um, from Pembroke, Ontario, Canada, and it's so hot outside. Well, I wouldn't say it's hot here, so I kind of envy you. Kelly Parker from Arizona. Jeffrey, oh, Margie from cloudy Spokane. Nice, yeah, it is, it is cloudy and cool here today. I'm in Spokane as well. Eileen from New York. Long Island. Long Island, got it. Arlene, good morning with my wonderful sister in Montana City, Montana. Nice. Christine from Central Iowa. This is great. Michelle in Indiana found us on Facebook. Excellent. That's good to know. That's helpful. Wanda, I'm in hot New Hampshire. You guys on the eastern side are getting heat today. Amy from Montana learned about it from my mom and auntie. Fantastic. That's the best way. Donna from Wisconsin. And Eileen, cheers. Right back at you. <laughs> LF from Northern New Jersey. And that's all. Wow. You guys aren't very. Like and subscribe. Yeah. yeah. You're not talking a lot this morning. <laughs> but do like and subscribe. Um, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel and then if you click on the little bell icon, that's what gives you the notifications when new episodes come. And I'd love if you would share this too. Share to people now. They can watch it now or share the fact that I do this every two weeks and people can chime in at any time. And the replays do go up too. So you don't have to attend the live ones. The beauty of the live, of course, is that you can ask questions as we work and we can chat. Okay, one last sip. Let's get to work. So I am quilting. Let me just adjust my microphone here. I am quilting on my buddy Lucy. Lucy is a Gamel 26 inch Elevate. So there's quite a bit of throat clearance. I know lots of you may not have that much. That does not need to... Um, detract from your quilting enjoyment, but I do a lot of this edge to edge work. So it helps me be efficient with my time to have a big throat space. So yeah, Lucy and I will be quilting today and I'm just gonna move her. Do I want to go left or right, Dave? This is the challenge of live streaming these types of videos is we're working with very large equipment in a very small room and now you can see right over the top of Lucy. Perfect, okay, let's get started loading. So here is the backing for my quilt. If you're new and haven't seen me load before, this might strike you as a different method of doing it, but it is fast and absolutely wonderful. 
So I use the red snapper system, which has a little tiny, um, a little tiny pole inserted in my leader and I'll snap a clamp on top of it. But you can also do this same sort of method with pins. So don't get hung up on the tool that I'm using. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. I do not have to take the time to find the center of my back or my leader or anything like that. I'm just going to pick a convenient place on my long arm and today convenient relative to the camera and start loading. Whether you're pinning or whether you're using red snappers, doesn't matter, just start loading. The critical thing is that you get your backing smooth, neither stretched nor bunched up. So it helps to kind of lay out a long expanse of it first so you can see that there are no um, bulges or pulls. And you need this first edge to be nice and straight. So I've arranged my backing such that I have a selvage on this edge. I've also double checked with the sizing of my quilt beforehand. I prefer to load a backing with the seam running horizontally. When the seam runs vertically, that can, as you can imagine, put just a little bit of tension on your backing fabric and can interfere with loading it perfectly smoothly because that seam always wants to pull a little bit tighter. So when possible, load with the seam horizontally. It's just easier. So I'm just going along my first straight selvage edge. Squeezing my little red snappers on. These, by the way, are a great tool. I don't, I'm not an affiliate or anything like that. I just really, really like them. But I will warn you, they do require hand strength. So if that's not a thing that comes easily to you, they might not be your best choice. You might want to stick with pins or there are other systems out there. This is just the system that I know. So now I'm tossing my backing all the way across my back rail and over the back of my machine. And you're going to see me come around and you'll probably get a great view of the back of my head as I work over here. What I want to be sure to do is get my fabric straight, really straight and smooth over the rail because I haven't centered it right. So I'm relying on laying out my fabric straight to do, I can't really get into the camera, to do the work of making this backing be square. So I want to be sure that there are no um, kind of ridges. I'll show you. If I pull this off to one side, can you see how I'm starting to get these funny angled pulls? That's a clue to me. So I want to adjust until my fabric is really nice and smooth. And I do it all the way down. You can kind of see where my hand is. All the way down the front of the machine. Make sure it's smooth all the way down and onto the floor. And now when I start rolling, it's going to roll straight onto my rollers. And I can actually watch as the roll forms on the rollers. And I can watch and see, if I have a straight edge on it anyways, that it is rolling straight. And it is so simple. Once you try this method, I don't think you'll ever go back to the whole centering process. So I'm rolling, rolling, and I take the time if I need to, to double check that there are no creases forming on here, no wrinkles going on, smooth things out. And in fact, you probably can't see it on camera, but where this seam is, the one piece is a little longer than the other and I don't have to worry about that or have it centered or anything like that. I just need to keep pulling it on with the straight of grain. And there you see there's a bit of fullness in the middle so I'm walking back over smoothing that out. Again, these little precautionary checks are still much faster than finding the center of everything. And now I just roll till there's a couple inches extending beyond my leader. I can see it from the wrong side of the machine. I'm sure that you can't on camera. And then I run back around and clip the last edge. Just making sure it's all smooth.
Now the red snapper system comes with, um, let me show you, hang on one second. I'm not even sure what their term is for them. But it comes with these little, I cannot get in the camera, there we are, almost basting clips. And I think that's how they recommend you do it, that you put a bunch of these kind of interspersed along your leader and to hold things in place. But let me show you how I do it. And you try and see what works for you. But for me, it works to get my clip on the fabric, kind of smoothing that fabric down. And then I grasp it with my left hand and hold it firmly in place. And then on the right, I just start pressing it on. I have seen other red snapper users bend their snapper this way to push it on and it does open up the channel a little bit more. I find that my fabric kind of gets away from me. So I have learned to do it this way. Again, you experiment. So I basically pin it or baste it with my left hand, clamp it with my right hand all the way along. You can probably hear me puffing a little bit. It does take a little bit of oomph. And morning calisthenics, that's what it is. And just like that, my backing is loaded. And can you see, this is nice and smooth. It doesn't pull to one side or to the other. There aren't any saggy bits. As it happened, I had selvage on the last end too, so it was nice and straight. But sometimes there's a crooked piece on my backing and I try to have that on that final end, right? Because then it doesn't really matter. I just roll it on my roller as far as it can go and I put my clips on in a straight line and hey presto, I don't have to worry if my quilt maker did not square up the backing. So I absolutely love this method. And Dave's telling me there's a question or two. Let's see them. Oh, here's some more people coming in. Jeannie from Oceanside, New Brunswick. Welcome, Jeannie. Hot, hot. Mickey from North Georgia Mountains. And Suze DeWitt, would you do this the same if using Minky Cuddle on the back since it's stretchier fabric? I do load it the same way. I'm really, really, really careful not to overstretch it because when you are rolling it up, um, there's a bit of friction, right, as it's feeding over the back roller. So... I have not had trouble with it. I, in fact, just did a minky a couple days ago, and it worked out just fine. And I had the selvages at the top and bottom end as well. So, but it worked fine. So it's a little tougher even to get the snappers to clip on because it's just that much thicker and bulkier, but I had no trouble with it. It works fine. So that is our backing loaded. On to our batting. Today, as so often, I am using Hobbs 8020 in natural, so it's not bleached white. So that is 80% cotton, 20% poly. To me, this batting is the perfect blend of a nice loft. Um, it washes and wears well. It creases less when a quilt is folded than 100% cotton does. And it is economical. So to me, it's the perfect batting for most quilts. I love me a good wool batting too, but the Hobbs 8020 is just a great thing. And I'm going to mention to you guys, because I did say this was beginner friendly, an extra tip in here. It is a step I don't usually take, but it's one you can take. And it's particularly help you helpful with Minky. And that is when you set your batting on top of your backing, if you're unsure about the squareness of it, or how to line up your quilt top nice and square and straight, you can actually load your long arm at the top end and run a line of stitching just through the batting and the backing. And then that row of stitching, I should back up a bit. I do have something on my machine called a channel lock, so that's kind of critical. I can put that horizontal lock on so it gives me a perfectly horizontal line. And then that's a good way to load the top of my quilt against that horizontal line, right? I'm not going to take the time to do it today because I don't want to make this into a multi-hour show. And I don't usually. I've done so many quilts that I tend to just eyeball that. 
because you've also got, of course, your red snappers or whatever your leader system is to give you a bit of a guideline too, right, for that straight edge. So here comes our quilt. I should show you a little bit. Can you see that? Super cute little wildlife blocks. You can kind of see it. And this is another tip that is just my own preference. Fairly often I get in a quilt top or a quilt backing that is directional. And so I try to always load the top of whatever the direction is to the left. Just so that I don't always have to get confused or keep checking which way I loaded the backing. In this case, the backing is not directional, but the quilt is. But you can see all the bears and mountain sheep are head to the left. So I'm just laying out the quilt fairly straight and flat, picking a few threads off as I go. And before I start basting, we're going to take a minute to talk threads. And I'm going to take a minute to have a sip of coffee. OK, thread choice. Oh my goodness, stretch. Dave, would you mind getting me the one off the bobbin winder? Just clip the thread and bring it. Um, thread choice. Boy, I think if you asked half a dozen quilters, you'd get about 10 opinions about how to choose threads. But here's my philosophy. Some of the choices that I had are here. A lot of quilters that I've seen on YouTube or even in books will say to use the lightest color that's in a quilt when you've got a multicolored quilt and you're trying to decide what thread to use. So this is about the lightest color that is in the plaid. Um, it's not going to be super easy for you to see these demonstrated, but I'll still show you what I do and you can use the same thought process at home. What I usually do is open my spool of thread and create a nice little puddle of it so that I can see what a strand or two or five of thread actually looks like on the different fabrics. And I'll move it around on the various fabrics. So this lighter thread is about the same color as the lightest areas in the plaid. Okay, so that's option one. Option two is a blue that matches kind of the sky that is behind all the animals. It's a little bit paler. I didn't have a blue that exactly matched. So again, I'm going to make a little puddle of that blue. Option three is a dark brown, similar to the dark brown sashing and the dark brown areas of the plaid. I did not bring a black. I didn't think that that was a very likely option. I suppose it's a possibility, but. So making puddles of all these fabrics, or all these threads, I'm sorry. Here's what I look at. Because I'm doing an edge to edge pattern, right? A similar amount of thread is going to be over every area of the quilt. So I'm moving my little puddles across each of the fabrics. And what I find with the dark brown, for example, it blends beautifully in the dark brown areas, obviously. It looks pretty nice on the plaid. It's pretty stark on the blue. It's pretty dark against that blue. Okay, so that's one choice. Now let's look at the blue. It obviously blends very nicely on the blue. Pretty high contrast on the brown, pretty high contrast on the black, and shows up quite a bit on the plaid too, and actually doesn't look all that pretty on the plaid. Having a blue thread on an entirely shades of brown plaid, I don't love. Okay, now looking at my palest one. This matches very well on the plaid. It blends in very nicely there. Not too bad on the blue. Not too bad on the brown. It's pretty stark on the black, but this is my favorite so far. But I'm going to show you the final one, which is what I actually chose. This is also a brown, and it does not perfectly match anything in the quilt. And you might think, why the heck are you doing that? But here's my rationale. It contrasts about equally with all of the fabrics, right? So it's, it blends with all the shades of brown in the plaid, because there's three or four shades in there. It's a bit different from the blue, but still blends. It's not high contrast. Likewise on the black, likewise on the brown. So to me, this is the perfect thread that I feel like shows up fairly evenly across all of the fabrics. 
if I were to choose, for example, a black, let's just go crazy for a second, it would totally disappear within the black areas and then kind of reappear on all the lighter colored areas, especially the blue. So that's my reasoning for not choosing, for example, the lighter thread because it will blend so nicely in the plaid areas, but then it's so high contrast in other areas. And to me, that looks like the thread is kind of stopping and starting. And I don't love that look. So that's my rationale for thread. I've chosen that middle range of brown. So this is very much an opinion. You might like high contrast threads and you might choose to go a different route. That's totally fine. I'm just telling you how I arrived at the process. Okay, are there some questions about thread while I wind these up? No loading. Oh, more about loading? Yeah. Okay, let's have some questions about loading then. What if the sewist has sewn the seam a little crooked? If you load by the selvage, won't the whole thing be off? And do you always turn the quilt sideways to get the seam horizontally? I do as often as I can turn the quilt sideways to get the seam horizontally. You get the least distortion from that seam as you roll it up. Otherwise, you kind of have to pay attention to that seam, hold a hand on it to keep it smooth, that sort of thing. Uh, the first part of the question, oh, what if the seam is crooked so the selvage isn't straight? Well, I would still assume that the first selvage that I loaded at the front end was straight. And if you remember, when I got to the final end of the quilt, I said it doesn't really matter if that end is straight or not. If there's any excess, I just let it extend beyond my red snappers. So either way, it's good. Okay, just putting all these spools out of the way. One more. And there's another comment. Margie, my machine A1 doesn't have electronic channel lock, so I have a clamp from a hardware store and manually clamp the horizontal wheel. That's a great tip because there are lots of long arm quilters that do not have the channel locks, which I'm lucky enough to have. And so, yes you are able to get from the hardware store or even sometimes the stationary store, the type of clips that are spring loaded, you flip back the little handles, you know, and are spring loaded and different machines are a bit different, but there's usually a way you can clamp either one of the real wheels or one of the rails to make your machine just run in a nice horizontal line. So let's get started. I need my glasses for the actual quilting. This whole glasses business is for the birds, isn't it? So I'm going to now baste the outer perimeter of my quilt. And I do this for every quilt I work on, whether it's edge to edge or custom. This just provides stability. It keeps the quilt from being able to shift. And it's really nice for the maker when they go to bind it. It's really convenient for them to have this nice crisp edge. And I'm going to put my vertical channel lock on again because I'm lucky enough to have it. So now my machine is locked into a straight stitch up and down, perfectly straight. So I can actually adjust the edge of my quilt if I need to when I'm sewing to make it straight. Does that make sense? So if I did not have that channel lock, I might take a little more time and pin my quilt in place. But that's kind of a cheater shortcut for me. So now I've got my horizontal lock on. And because I know I'm stitching a straight line, I'm using my left hand to just make little adjustments to the fabric. I see here I need to actually tug it up a little bit more. And I can do that because I know that my stitching line is straight. So I can just line up my quilt top as I go. This is also a point at which if my border had extra fullness in it, quite a bit of that can be manipulated with your left hand. So I usually am putting a little tension on the area that's already stitched because even with the smoothest quilt, your hopper foot tends to want to push a little fabric ahead of it. So I just put a little pressure on the area that's already stitched and it pulls the area I'm going to stitch under the needle. And if there was excess fullness, I'd just be putting more pressure on that back end. And you can work in quite a bit of fullness with just that simple technique. Okay. 
and the questions being asked what type of thread I'm using from Donna, I have Isochord 100% Poly loaded. It is my personal favorite thread. It was developed, and still is, used for embroidery. So for, you know, commercial purposes, caps and t-shirts and things like that. So it was developed for high-speed embroidery machines. So it is very suitable for high-speed quilting machines. It's a very strong thread. It is 40 weight. Um, I feel like it's fairly, it's a fine 40 weight somehow, if that's possible. And I am putting magnets on the front of my bar to keep my quilt flat. And I should talk about that just a little bit more. What I've done is called floating my top. So it's basted up the left side, across the top, and down the right. But the front edge of the quilt and the batting are just floating. They're just hanging over the rail in front of me. But I want to be sure that as I quilt in this area, I'm not pulling up my quilt in the middle, right? My sides are basted, they're fixed, but I don't want to pull up any excess fabric in the middle. So that's what these magnets do. Because my rails are iron and are magnetic, these very inexpensive magnets from the hardware store, I just line them up in a row on the front and they hold my quilt perfectly steady. So now I've got a working surface that can't go anywhere. It's not going to shift on me. And Dave has put a link for those bars in the chat window. Boy, if I had a dime for every one of those bars I've mentioned to somebody. <laughs> Eileen is asking if I'm a lefty. Yep. I am not, although I tend to do funny things like swing a baseball bat left-handed. So there's that. Oh, yes, and I haven't basted down the right-hand side. You guys got to remind me of these things. Because that's important. So here again, I'll slow down so you can see what I'm doing. My hopper foot is, again, is going to want to push the fabric out a little bit in front. So I can either be grasping behind my needle and putting a little tension on that, or what you just saw me doing, which is I'm running my fingers along in the front and just being sure that that fabric feeds under the needle. You know, know where your fingers are at all time. Don't, don't lift them. Don't have your pinky in the air when you're doing that. But I do it. Um, and I'm going to tell you another funny personal thing. I know we all read from left to right. But because I always stitch around the perimeter of my quilt in that order, left, top, and right, I usually start my quilting in the top right-hand corner. So just for cuz. And the last thing I do to get ready to quilt is put my stretchers on. on each side. Okay. Dave says he's going to move a camera so that you can see my stretchers. Can it be seen on the other end, Dave? Yes. You guys forgive us while we talk through some of these processes. It's always a challenge to try and show the different big areas that we're working on. So this, again, is part of the Red Snapper system. And it's a clip that's got just a very narrow little channel that you've got to try and fit the fabric in. And this quilt maker has torn the edge of her backing, which is a fine way to get a nice straight edge. But it also gives it a little bit uh, of stretch. And boy, I can't get it in that little narrow channel to save my life. Sometimes I can coax it in with the edge of a pin. But today, because I'm on camera, I cannot. So we're not going to spend any more time on that. We're just going to put two clamps on and make it simple. So the reason I prefer the red snapper clamps is because these ones just have a single, can you see on camera, Dave? I can't see what they're seeing, and so I don't know. Um, you'll see it at the other end, too. But obviously, when I just have single clamps like this, you're getting a, a single narrow point of pull on your quilt, which is not ideal. So I make really sure not to pull too hard. I don't want to get a scalloped edge on my quilt where my clamps have pulled hard on it. But I'll just put them on there gently. And I'll try the red snapper at this end too. And I'm not only a red snapper gal. There are other clamps. Uh, I know there are artisans that make them out of wood. But the same idea that they're long. And they put equal tension on this whole working area. I've almost got it. It's so close. There we go. Woohoo!
and I put, you know, a little tension on there, but not a lot. You're not trying to stretch the heck out of your quilt. You're just trying to keep it from pulling in inadvertently. So it's just, it's just gently snug. And I should show you this too, because this is a question I get asked a lot. How tight is your working area? If I put my fingers up from below the quilt, I should be able to grab them. So this is taut, but it's not a drum. No sound, see, no drum. And one other trick. This is my grandfather's yardstick. There you can see it. Any long thing will do. I've seen people do it with inexpensive curtain rods, anything that's long and rigid. You can put under the strap of your clamps so that your quilting machine head does not bump up against this area when you get to the end of the quilt. The less clearance that you have here, the more that matters. Does that make sense? So you're just lifting that clamping apparatus out of the way. Okay, I think that's all the setup. Let's take another question or two, get one more sip of coffee, and we'll start quilting. Get on to the real stuff. Okay. Sue is asking, any suggestions if the bars won't work for a different machine? There's too much fabric on my bar and the magnets don't stick. I would check with your um, check with your dealer. I know that Gamel makes a proprietorial, is that the right word? Like a, a C clamp that is long and that clamps right over their bars. And I suspect that other brands and machines have something as well. They're not likely to be as inexpensive as these nifty magnetic bars. Um, maybe even ask at a hardware store. Maybe there is some type of C clamp that's got some give that you could purchase in the right diameter maybe someone in the chat maybe ask in facebook groups there are a number of long arm quilting groups on facebook and there are really knowledgeable people in there um, and if you're not already members in some of those groups actually i really encourage you to do that i both share tips and learn in those groups because there are people who have run into all kinds of things that i've never run into and this is one someone out there will have an idea i'm sure of some type of clamp that you can use I'm just going to get my coffee well out of the way. I see that the clamps are on the backing and the batting, but the snapper only on the back. Does that matter? Now, do you mean the snapper for like the top and bottom of loading my quilt or for the clamp on the side? And if you mean on the side, I purposely only put it on the backing and I purposely do my basting beforehand because then I have fixed the position of my my top of my quilt relative to the backing of the quilt right because there is a stitching line here that can't move so now when i put tension on my clamp it's putting tension across the whole thing because those layers are attached together does that make sense so that's how that's done let's get quilting i'm just going to lower my quilting rail a little bit and we're up and away so I'm quilting oak leaves today. Honestly, you will not be able to see the quilting pattern. Um, these episodes are not so much about the actual quilting design as about the big picture process. So I'll try when I can to give you a glimpse of it, but I don't know how much of the actual quilting you'll be able to see. However, I will take photographs and I will share them on my social media over the next day or two, as soon as I have some good lighting. I grab some photos and then you can get a good look at the quilting itself. But for today, take note of kind of bigger picture things like how I move around the area of the quilt top. That will come in handy and that's the sort of thing you can't see from pretty photographs on Instagram, right?
If you follow me at all, you'll know that this type of freehand quilting is my absolute favorite. Believe me, it took me three times as long to do today because of talking through it. But usually, I can load a quilt just in minutes flat. And because there's no need to align a paper pantograph, there's no need to size a digital design, all that stuff, I can just load it, boom, boom, and get quilting. I absolutely love it. I love the fact that I can personalize a quilt to, you know, I can tweak a design to suit whoever I'm quilting for. There's just nothing I don't like about it. So I'm pretty much going to settle in and just quilt across this entire pass. One more thing I'll talk about before I do it, and that is to regulate or not to regulate stitch length. So in case you're not familiar with those terms, a stitch regulator is what you are hearing my machine do now. So when I move more quickly, can you hear that? The motor speeds up. It is attempting to keep a regular stitch length, which I have preset. When I set my machine on a constant type of stitching speed, then what happens is my needle moves at a constant pace and it's up to me to move the machine appropriately. And Dave's signaling me for a question. Okay, we're just gonna pause for one second. Apparently my camera is acting up a little bit, so we're gonna unplug and reset it and plug it back in. So bear with us just a moment while we try and get that more clear for you. Well, they can't really see me. Ooh, not really. But I'll keep talking for a moment about the non-regulated stitch speed. So the constant speed is when the motor or needle moves at a constant speed, again, which I can preset. And then it's up to me to move the machine to maintain the stitch length. So I'm going to show that to you. And here's why. When I'm doing this type of edge-to-edge -edge work, I quite like that constant speed. It's more relaxing because you don't get this constant, you know, surge of noise and somehow curves can be made smoother um it just there's a little bit of drag when that stitch regulator is on so i like the smoothness of having the constant speed so as soon as we get our cameras going again dave are we ready you give me the high sign when we are as soon as the camera's ready i will turn that constant speed on and for my machine and i think for most this is the number of this speed is relative to the total speed that your machine could go and it's a percentage so i know this is a question you're going to ask so i'll tell you now i'm running at 55 percent speed that's comfortable for me so here we go so now it's up to me to move smoothly and to move at the right pace to get an appropriate stitch length If you have not done this before, it can be a little intimidating, so by all means, try it out slower. But I really encourage you to do it because it forces you to learn how to quilt smoothly, to move smoothly and not to, you know, whiz around the circles and then hesitate for ages in the corners. You've got to move smoothly. And it does take a little bit of practice, but it's, it's an awesome skill to have and I think produces a really great result and is enjoyable to do. I'm just gonna pause for a second. I feel like my top tension is a little tight. I'm seeing my quilting stitches look a little straight, if you will, on the top. So I'm just loosening that up a bit. So while I do this, because it's a little like watching paint dry, let me know what you guys are working on today. If you're in your studio sewing something up or in the kitchen baking, let me know what's happening in your world today.
pause, loosen that top tension a bit more if I can reach it. There we go. You can get a bit better look at the leaves when I'm on the blue. This is a very freeform design. I can curve and bend these leaves a little, a lot, in any direction. I can give them one bend or two bends. So it might look a little complex, but it's really, really flexible. You can make it fit into any little corner that you need to. thing I cannot do easily is stop and pick off threads when I'm quilting in regulated speed so that little loose one I've just quilted over is staying. It'll have to get picked off later. Another thing you might find helpful if you have not done this really uh, freestyle type of quilting before 
is you really need to know where the front bar of your machine is. In other words, where the end of your quilting has to be, how far you can go toward yourself. Am I making sense? I don't know if I can talk and quilt at the same time. <laughs> Anyways, a good way to do that is either run a chalk line at the, at the edge of how far you can quilt, or what I do is even simpler, and I get a piece of painter's tape, or I can get a piece of painter's tape. I've quilted enough now, I have a pretty good idea where that is, but you can lay a piece of painter's tape on there as a, as a visual guide, right? That's as far as I can quilt, because there is nothing worse than zipping along at speed like this and running into that front bar and having a square leaf and having to stop and undo it. And there's about 40 stitches in one minute location. Yeah, so piece of tape can be a real great visual guide there. This quilt was made by my friend Janet, and she's done a great job of making it nice and flat and smooth. But often you will have quilt tops that do not necessarily lay perfectly flat and smooth, and they've got, um, you know, wavy borders, or they've got puffy centers, or whatever. So I try to feature those on these live episodes as well, too. I definitely do not try and get perfect quilts every time, so that I can show you how I deal with some of those things. So. If you're interested in any of them, refer back to previous episodes. Um, I'm really trying in my more recent episodes to have more detailed descriptions of the types of things that are covered. But in any event, all of the episodes have a thumbnail with a photograph of the quilt that is being worked on and the design that's being featured so that you can easily go back on YouTube and find the replays and have a watch of those if you want to.
we're nearly to the end of our first pass, so if you have any questions, now's a good time to be typing them in the chat window. I'll talk for a few minutes as I advance the quilt and get it set up for the next pass. there we are. So I just stop with my needle down and I leave the needle in as I advance. Um, I don't find that that makes an appreciable difference in the squareness of the quilt. But if you're worried about that, you certainly could break thread and lift your needle. I do have a very deep throat in my machine, which is handy when I'm quilting, you know, a single block or something like that, a star that I can reach all the way to the top. But in practical terms, I cannot easily quilt at the full length of it. So even my advance, I've got about six inches of clearance at the other end because I can't comfortably quilt at arm's length. Another question I get asked a whole bunch is about the height of my machine. As you can see, it's way up in my rib cage. A lot of quilters will recommend that it be the height of your elbow so that your hand is at, you know, a 90 degree uh, angle when you're quilting. And I guess this is a matter of personal preference, but for me, because I do this type of quilting a lot, this freehand work, and because of my machine, our, our peop, which, our, which camera are we on? You can't really see Lucy, but she has a light bar kind of right in front of my working area. So because of the way visibility is and for all those reasons, for me, it is more relaxing and less shoulder tension to have my machine at this height. So my best advice is to experiment with a couple of different heights, like two inches different in a couple of different increments to see what's most comfortable for you. I don't know that I've ever seen anyone with one as high as I like, but I do like mine this high, so. Okay, we have tons of questions. Let's have them. Let me get tons of coffee, okay? Just one second here, and I will not lean over the quilt with my coffee, I promise, even if the angle looks like that. Eileen, so happy I found you. Never saw this done before. Which part? <laughs> but I'm glad you found me too. Dana, is there a start date to your next free motion class? Oh, excellent question, Dana. Um, I'll, I'll dive into that for a minute. I was gonna come to it later, but I do offer a class, and it's called Freehand Quilting Masterclass, which talks about there's about 35 designs in it in particular, and they're all taught to you piece by piece in an incremental fashion. And it's with a focus on helping you to find the freedom to be able to quilt without patterns, without pre-marking, to do what I'm doing today, which is just load a quilt and start quilting. So it's a six module class. I'm not gonna go into all the details. This is not really a sales pitch, but it's there. And it is going to be starting up again in July. So in the next week or two, you're going to start seeing things in my newsletter about it. I always do my introduction with a webinar, and that webinar is gonna be a deep dive into quilting all over feathers. So if that's something you've always wanted to do, sign up for my newsletter and you'll get notification of when that's happening. For my newsletter, you can just go to my website, stitchedbysusan.com, and it'll pop up in a few seconds there. That also will give you notifications of these events, you know, a day or two in advance and what time they are and kind of what topic and that sort of thing too. Kelly, is what you're doing totally random or do you have a set design in your head? Well, I have, like I'm, I'm quilting a kind of oaky leaf, right? So I have the design set in this way. I always do the stem first and then I do the bits that are around it. But it's totally freestyle in this way. I can bend it in any direction. I can put two lobes on the leaf or three I can do a one-sided leaf with a stem and just lobes on one half. Like that is all completely freestyled. I'm just fitting it in as I go. And all the designs in the masterclass are that way. They are entirely freehand. They sometimes will use a tool like painter's tape or like chalk for kind of visual guides, but it's all freehand, it's all doodling. Debbie, when basting, what stitch length do you use? It did not appear to be a basting stitch. You're right, good eyes. My machine does have the option of a basting stitch. I just find it takes more time to go back and forth 
than to just use my regular stitching stitch. So that's just me. And I've got it set on 12 stitches per inch right now. And I just have used that throughout. Now, if I were basting through the middle of my quilt with a more complex project, then I would put a longer basting stitch because I would need to undo it as I go. But this basting stitch remains within the binding all the time, so it's fine. Eileen Trescott, did you throw in a single spike to fill in a small space when there wasn't enough space for a full leaf? Yes, I did. And that's a, a free tip I'll give you guys for any freehand design today. Have some little element of it that you can put into little spaces, a little partial flower, a little, in this case, it's a little spike similar to the stem of the leaf that I can just reach out and fill little awkward corners. Jeffrey or Margie, question. I noticed you are going right to the basting line. I missed half of that, sorry, Dave. Right to the basting line, so the binding will probably hide some of the quilting design. What are your thoughts about that? When I do my QOV quilts, they don't seem to like that. That's an interesting point. And here's my thought process on that one. A few years ago, I was entering quilts at MQX, which is Machine Quilters Exposition. And it's a, um, a national show for machine quilting only. Was, I don't think they're actually operating anymore since the pandemic. Anyway, they had a category just for edge to edge quilting. And I loved that. I entered it every year once I knew about it. And in fact, I think I got a ribbon every year. A few of these ribbons came from there. So. I asked that question at one point because I thought too that that's sort of a mark of excellence when you don't run off into the batting, when you make your quilting fit, you know, within those basting lines. And guess what they said to me? The judges don't care. So after that, I just kind of relaxed into really using that basting line as a place to travel, that sort of thing. So yeah, I don't make it a point to not go over it into it anymore. And I have not heard that from the Quilt of Valor folks, I'll be honest with you. So um, I've not heard that. That's all I know. You ask what everybody's doing? Oh yeah, what's everyone doing? Let's hear it. Mickey, today is laundry day. Oh, exciting, Mount Washmore. <laughs> Sue, I just finished a small quilt top with 18 Lemoyne stars in it. I'm thinking about how to quilt it. The blocks range from 12 inches to three inches, so I may run into issues with bulky seams. Wow, ooh, good luck with that. Did I post a video about bulky seams, Dave? I know where it was. Okay, you guys, here's another little pitch for content. Forgive me. So I recently started a podcast. I think we've released 10 episodes so far. And within each episode, I do something called pins and needles. It's tips for you sharp quilters out there. And it just so happens that I think it was last week's had to do with bulky seams. And there are a couple ways to deal with them. Um, one sec. Sip of coffee. It's not really part of this quilt top, but hey, what else have I got to talk about? There's a couple ways to deal with them. But one thing I do recommend is that you try to quilt over the bulky area. And I'm gonna baste while I talk because I don't wanna lose time here. Oh, hang on a second. Okay, hold the thought about the bulky seams. I'll do that while I'm quilting on the next pass, okay? Remind me if I forget, but let's go on to questions for a minute. Jill, you gotta move your hand, Dave. <laughs> I'm sitting on the front porch of our cabin on Lake Vermilion, lucky you, in Northern Minnesota. Just got back from a morning kayak ride to check on the local loon's nest. It's a beautiful morning, how nice. I'm so glad you got to do that. What is everyone else doing? Patricia, good morning from Kennewick, Washington. Oh, there's no late, there's no late. Starting a quilt made by a friend that uses flannel shirts of a grandpa who passed with family members' names embroidered in some squares, hoping it comes out well because I feel the importance. I'm sure it will. They will feel the love. Okay. Jenny is saying, just a note, you can't get into this event through your YouTube page. You have to enter through Facebook. I found you. Hi from Bend, Oregon. So Dave, the producer guy, is telling me he has fixed that now, but thank you for the heads up. We appreciate that. Like we're just us two doing this, right? And so we try to get our I's dotted and our T's crossed, but there's sometimes things we miss. There's Dave waving at you. <laughs> okay, anyone else busy doing fun things, Dave, that I should know about? Oh, nice, Lauren. Susan's classes are well worth the time and money. Excellent teacher. I've learned so much already and I'm still in the class. Highly recommend. Thanks, Lauren, appreciate that. 
Okay, let me get this side basted and we'll get started quilting again and then I'll talk about bulky seams because it is something that we run into so often. And by the way, I put my stitch regulator back on to baste. It runs away from me too fast if I have the regulator off. And can you see, once again, I'm putting tension on the area that's already stitched. If I didn't, my hopper foot would be pushing both my batting and my quilt top out in front of me. But when I put that little bit of tension on it, look how perfectly flat and smooth that sews. And I don't, for just home use quilts like this, I don't spend a ton of time like loading my measuring tape to make everything perfectly squared off and things like that. But I do constantly look up and evaluate. So if there's piecing lines, I'll be making sure they're straight across the front end of the quilt here, right? I'll be looking at the area that's floating in front of me to see if there are any odd puckers or things going on that I need to be aware of. So I'm always assessing as I'm working so that I don't get an ugly surprise when I get to the bottom of the quilt. If you're having trouble with that, then I recommend either that you load a tape measure across the top to help you square it up, or you baste your entire quilt, which is another topic for another day, so that you know that it's all straight and square before you start laying down the detailed quilting. So when I say baste the entire top, I mean to literally secure through the middle. Um, multiple times down the quilt, not just basting the perimeter, which is what I'm doing today. It's just an added security. Some quilters do it for every quilt. But you're in my studio, I'm showing you how I do it. So I've got my clamps on the right and left side holding things fairly snug. And by the way, if you do have questions, you know, about classes or even other topics, um, feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat window and just tuck a cue in front of them if you would so that we don't miss them. And I'll try to come back to them. But I don't want to lose my train of thought on the um, bulky seams either. This one does have a few. You've maybe heard you know, the needle kind of pop, pop when I go over them. So the one thing that I started mentioning was that I endeavor to quilt over or very close to, and by very close, I mean within an eighth of an inch of bulky seams. These are not terribly bulky, but the Lemoyne star that you were talking about for sure will have bulky seams. If you quilt a quarter to a half an inch away from them, what you'll get is a bulky area that pops right up and is um, exaggerated because the area around it is quilted down flat. So I think it's really important to quilt over bulky seam areas. And let me mention before I get started to one other thing that pertains to today's quilting, and that is that I alternate my pass direction. So my first pass I started on the right and quilted all the way to the left. Now I'm going to start on the left and quilt to the right. These leaves are pretty organic and free flowing, but for some designs like say feathers that are a little bit directional, that just helps the whole thing look random and not look like rows, right? It's just one more way to make it look natural. Uh, bulky seams. So we've mentioned quilting over them. Also, if you are doing something freehand like this, where you're not uh, carefully aiming at specific points or stitching in the ditch. Then if your machine has a spoon foot, that can be really helpful. It helps your hopper foot to glide over those seams. And if you're really desperate and they're really, really thick, then it is helpful to use actually a hammer or a mallet, or in a pinch, the handle of a set of metal shears to literally pound them flat. So easiest done for sure before your quilt is loaded. You'll need something really solid to pound on like the floor or a two by four or something like that. And then either a rubber mallet or uh, a regular hammer with maybe a piece of batting wrapped around the head of it 
so it doesn't damage the fabric, right? And just thump sharply on that, right on that seam allowance, and it will flatten it considerably. I recently um, quilted a flannel quilt where the seams had been pressed to one side. And as you can imagine, those seam allowances were, some of them were more than a quarter inch thick. And so I had to pound many of them because I literally could not feed them under Lucy's hopper foot. And it worked, it worked, got it done. Okay, I'm gonna go back to putting my stitch regulator on because I just find that much more enjoyable. Or, sorry, my constant stitch on. You guys will learn this about me. I can't always talk and quilt at the same time. Sometimes my tang just gets tangled. I really do encourage you to give this constant speed method a try. And if you don't know how to tell what speed to start at, I think I would begin in the teens as a percentage of your machine's, you know, possible pace. And then work your way up from there. And the way I kind of gauge it is if I'm getting long stretched out stitches very often, then I've got my speed too slow, right? I'm moving around my quilt faster than my machine is sewing so speed it up a bit if i'm feeling pushed like someone's behind me kind of pushing me all the time like i just can't quite keep up or decide where to go next i've got it set too high slow things down you should be able to relax and control the machine and not feel hurried so find where that happy place is for you and sometimes it varies from design to design as well like if I was quilting pebbles, for example, that's another place I love to use the constant speed. You get rounder pebbles. I do it at a much slower rate because you're, you're making smaller movements and covering less area. This one I have going pretty fast because I'm making fairly long sweeping lines. So find the sweet spot for you. I'm curious, are any of you making plans to go to any live quilt shows this year? And if so, where? And especially, would I want to go to them? I've been so busy quilting, honestly, I haven't put much attention into finding out who's doing the in-person shows this year, and I have not entered a single quilt in a show. But I'd love to have some good recommendations for shows you all might be thinking of attending.
when I realized I talked to you guys about the podcast, but I didn't say what it is. The title is Measure Twice, Cut Once. And the easiest way to find it, especially if you're not already a podcast listener, if you are, you can find it on your podcast platform. But if you're not already a podcast listener, then if you go to podcast.stitchedbysusan.com, all the various uh, platforms are listed there and you can pick a favorite. just pausing for a second I'm feeling a bit of resistance and I realize you guys probably can't see it but my my roller because I rolled the quilt and it's a bit fluffier under there it's just resting ever so slightly on my long arm arm if you will so I'll just raise that up a little and we're back in business For any freehand design like this, I try to judge my spacing based on the scale of the design. So what I mean by that is the areas within a leaf that are unquilted are about an inch to an inch and a quarter. So when I'm trying to decide, you know, as I'm going past an unquilted area, do I need to fill that in or not? If there are any spaces, I try to make them about that size, about an inch and a quarter. So if I have a two and a half inch, you know, unquilted area, then I feel like, yeah, I need to quilt something in there. To me, that's what gives the overall effect when the quilt is finished of even texture overall. There are not areas that have super tight quilting and not large areas that have none. And that's just a general rule of thumb. That's not, not hard and fast by any means, but gives you an idea. And my leaves today are about, yeah, anywhere from two to probably five inches long each leaf. top thread just broke and did I mention that we're live and unscripted and occasionally that happens for reasons that you just don't know and so to begin with I'll just rethread it and start quilting again if it happens a second time then I'll say oh something's amiss and I'll start looking at tension or uh, fresh needle or something like that but for the moment we'll just rethread and again. So only the top broke, so I have to pull up the bobbin thread and trim that one. And this is a great time to talk about stopping and starting. So I very seldom bury threads on a quilt. That's a whole other technique which involves um, 
not doing short tiny lock stitches but only starting into stitches at the right size and then going back and knotting the thread and pulling the knot underneath between the layers all that stuff we're not going to talk about that so much today what i'm going to do today i've cut my bobbin thread now i'm going to simply pull up my bobbin thread so to do that i'm backing up are we looking at it close up dave just so i know what everyone's seeing Okay, so I'm backing up about a quarter inch of what was already stitched. I've just trimmed the threads close. And it's actually at a good spot. It's right over a seam allowance, so it's a nice spot to camouflage it. If it was out in the middle of the blue, I would consider undoing till I'm at a good camouflaging spot. But here we are at one. So I've backed up about a quarter inch, take one stitch with my needle, and my top thread now is going to pull up my bobbin thread. That's how I always start. And I probably should have shown this right at the beginning, but you're getting it now pull on that bobbin thread and now I've got my two threads at the top bobbin I can pull on it here and I can hear that it's unspooling off my bobbin and I've got my needle thread here so I'm going to hang on to them both and then go back to where that thread came up from the bottom that's going to be my starting point and moving just infinitesimally I'm going to make about four or five tiny stitches in the direction I want to go and that's going to lock both my previous stitching is well held in place now and my new stitching as well is locked. And I'll leave the tails for a minute. I'll come back and trim them later. If I trim them now, I find that sometimes those stitches will pull out. So I'm just gonna launch right back into stitching and then I'll come back and trim the tails later. And that will be a pretty unobtrusive um, splice of my thread. And that's how I typically do it in the middle of a quilt top. Now I just gotta determine where I am in my design. Okay, got it. Okay, you guys are gonna laugh. I just ran out of bobbin thread. So now, here's, here's the plus side of that. That is probably why my top thread broke. Probably the last wind or two on the bobbin didn't have correct tension on them. So now, again, did I mention it's live and unscripted? I have to move it out of the way a little bit so that I can see what I'm doing. Now I'm going to literally unwind or unpick that last couple of inches. There's no point in having two splices that close to each other. Also, the last few inches of bobbin thread never have correct tension on them, so I always undo a little bit. Um, I know other quilters have sensors for when their bobbin is low. That usually has to do with the number of revolutions of a bobbin, which then changes for every type of thread and things like that. I personally don't bother with that. I just let the bobbin run out and then I change it. And actually that is anchored really good at the base of that stem. So I'm just gonna trim my thread and leave it right there. I usually, on a busy quilt like this, I drop my seam ripper right where my ending spot was so I can find it when I come back and we will get a fresh bobbin. I wind my own bobbins for most of my common threads, I keep a spare spool. So while I'm off camera, that's how long it's taking me to put a new bobbin on the winder and turn it on. And it'll just wind while I sew. I do have a freestanding winder. So what did that take me, two or three seconds? And I prefer to do it that way because I like to have matching or close to matching threads on my top and bottom. So I like to wind my own. So once again, I've taken one stitch, pulled up the bobbin thread, got my two threads and I'm hanging on to them with my right hand and I'm taking a few lock stitches. Not quite in the same hole. All four of them are spread over less than an eighth of an inch. They're really close together. Pull my threads off to one side and start stitching. I'm going to take a second to just check my tension on that because I've been having a little trouble with Lucy. So let's see what's the easiest way. I have to walk around to the other side so you might get the back of my head. And I'm checking it just by running my fingernail underneath. I can see on the top it looks fine. So if I run my fingernail firmly against those stitches on the bottom side, I could feel if there was any laddering, if that bottom tension was too tight. 
So now I can be pretty confident that it's all squared away. I tucked a wee little one in there and another wee little one here. No right or wrong to this. It's just like Bob Ross painting. It's your quilt. You can tuck a little leaf in or you can tuck a little sprig in. Whatever you think fits. Our daughter, by the way, has dubbed me the Bob Ross of quilting. She loves Bob Ross. And I don't know if that's a compliment or if it means I have a kind of um, boring voice. I don't know. But, you know, he's just so calm talking about whatever he's working on. So apparently that is me too. So... Again, I'm approaching the end of the pass. Great time to fire off your questions. And there is just one more pass. This was not a large quilt. And remember, I loaded it sideways, and so it's 60 inches long, and it's a little less than 50 wide. So my quilting depth has been 50 inches. There's an example again of me running right off into the basting. I don't personally see that as a problem. And like I said, MQX, you know, officially said that their judges anyway were not looking for that as a feature. And so I really relaxed about it. at the edge. And you can see I have multiple lines of stitching in that basting area. I'm keeping it well under a quarter inch from the edge of the quilt so that when Janet, whose quilt it is, goes to bind it, all of that falls within her seam allowance. I don't want her to have to fiddle with undoing bits of it. So I make sure it all stays within the quarter inch seam allowance. Your 
I will just roll this a bit and then we'll take some comments. Oh boy. I think I can get it all in one. All right, let's have some comments. Okay. I'll just smooth the quilt while we talk. All righty, we have some comments. Sandy, I live in Ontario, Canada, so border closed. No plans for this year, but hopefully next year. Would like to go to quilt retreat in Michigan this fall, if possible. Yeah. Yeah, I know all about the border being closed. We have a wee granddaughter in Canada. It's very sad. Haven't seen her in a long time. Sue, there's a quilt show near me in Omaha in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to going to that. How nice. Is that more a local one? It's not one I'm familiar with. Beverly from Palouse, that's not too far from me. Nice to see you. Uh, question, how many free motion designs do you have that you normally use? Your quilting is beautiful. Thank you. Um, oh, someone forgot to turn off his notifications. How many freehand quilting designs do I have? Oh gosh, I don't know how to answer that question. Quite a few, and I'm always thinking up new ones because I like to have variety. Yeah, quite a few. Um, if you guys are interested in seeing some more designs, there's an easy way to do that. I have a Pinterest account stitched by Susan, not surprisingly. And I have a board. Uh, are you putting it in the chat, Dave? Oh, it's already in the chat, Dave says. So you can just scroll up in the chat a little bit. So specifically, the Pinterest board is called My Gallery Edge to Edge. And I try to upload photographs in there of um, my quilts. And all the quilts in that gallery are my own quilting. So that'll give you some ideas. Dave, the first episode of the podcast is with Susan's sister and is a great story about their start in quilting. Episodes drop every Wednesday. That is true. So all of the episodes are interviews um, at this point with other quilters, some who have businesses or products, some who are just, they have a life story that has to do with quilting. So each one is very different from the one before. All right, so we are doing the final base of our quilt. I have, once again, just eyeballed this front edge. It's pretty straight. Janet's got a pretty smooth quilt for me. But if you had any questions about that, like if this edge was not in a straight line, pin it and make adjustments. If there was fullness in the border, you know, I would pin right and left and center and then in between and distribute that fullness. But this one is close enough, once again, because you're in my studio and I'm just showing you how I do it. I'm just going to wing it. I am going to put my channel lock on because then I know I get a straight seam. And that does tell me I need to pull in this side just a little bit. So I'm going to do that. thought so I'm about three quarters of an inch shy I think I can advance just a little more this is when my long throat space comes in handy I will be quilting kind of at arm's length but I can I can finish it I'm pretty sure in one pass there we are at the front now I've got my horizontal channel lock on now can you see I've got just ever so little fullness going on here so once again I'm going to put tension on the area that is already stitched and that is going to pull that little bit of excess right under the needle oh, sometimes I might have to coax it a little more with my fingers and once again you certainly could pin this in advance if you weren't comfortable winging it like I am
again I'm putting a little bit of pressure on the area already stitched just enough to keep the fabric from bubbling up behind um, I'll stop one sec to make a comment here lots and lots of quilters will say to baste from the bottom edge up so that you have to take in that excess I don't necessarily do that but you've got to always be aware you've always got to be looking if there's excess fabric above or if you're quilting forward and there's excess fabric below you've always got to be assessing don't just stitch and assume that it will come right in the end fabric is very malleable so you have to you have to guide it but that works in your favor too um, I was working on a quilt over the weekend that had it had a quite detailed pieced area in the middle and then it had a big solid uh, area of borders around it and that pieced area had significantly more fabric than the outer borders so that was a fun challenge but that's the flip side of fabric being uh, malleable is I literally could coax it to get taken up in the middle all that excess okay I am going to however break thread here because remember we're alternating directions of passes it may not matter so much on these oak leaves but it's just kind of a habit I have formed and it looks like I cannot quite reach my quilting area at the top so I am gonna have to back up just a little I'll have to fiddle a wee bit with rolling back and forth as I do this pass so to begin with because I'm in the basting line it's the same process as what I did in the middle of the quilt except it doesn't matter if my stitches show so I'm taking one stitch pulling up that bobbin thread and grasping them both taking a few quick stitches very close to each other doesn't matter what they look like because they're hidden in the basting line and then I'm up up and away and I'm going to turn my constant stitching back on Basically, I'm going to make this into two small passes. I just won't have to redo my clamps or anything. So I'm not, as you see, quilting all the way to the bottom of the quilt. I'm going to work my way across the quilt in a sort of partial pass. Then I'll roll it forward a wee bit more and quilt back across the last time.
I don't know if you're really able to see, because of the busyness of this print, the variety of shapes of leaf that I'm making. And I just had a top thread break again. Hmm. Well, I know it's not the bobbin this time. I think I will go ahead and put a new needle on because I do know that I've done a couple of quilts on this one and that seems like a logical precaution to take. Um, anyway, I was saying, I don't know if you're able to see the variety of leaves that I'm making. That, again, is the beauty of quilting freehand is you, you have that freedom. So both to fit it into places but also to make it your own. It's very much like handwriting. The skill is much like handwriting, but also the result in that each quilter's quilting will very much look their own. If you go to quilt these oak leaves, they probably won't look like mine, but that's okay. You have the freedom to play with them. Okay, I'm just going to take a moment here. You guys just bear with me while I'm off camera and get a new needle. of have this checklist, if you will, in my head of things, kind of starting with the easiest ones to do and working their way toward the more complex. So when I have a problem like this, I just start running down through those things. What shall I change? What can I do differently? I'm not sure why I threaded the needle while I was talking to you, by the way, knowing I was going to put a new one in. But anyway, changing the needle is a very easy thing to do and often will solve a dilemma. One of my favorite tools. Uh, you've probably not seen it close up, but I have this little tiny magnet bar. It's about three quarters of an inch long. And I can put that on the front of my needle and it lets me know when my eye is pointed straight forward. If you don't have such a thing as that, that came with my machine. I'll show you another trick. This is one of my quilting pins. You can insert a pin, a sewing pin is probably better, a little finer. You can insert a pin into the eye of the needle and it will let you know too whether it's canted a little bit. I know that my Lucy likes the needle turned ever so slightly toward the right, so I've done that when I inserted it. So you are you know, seeing this for reals, these, this is how it goes when I'm quilting a quilt and I have a dilemma. I just start running down my list of things to resolve. And what I did not do, people, is put my seam ripper where I stopped because now I can't find it. Hang on a second. Oh, there we are. <laughs> so same process as before. I'm going to overlap by about a quarter inch my previous stitching, maybe even a little less than a quarter inch. Pull up that bobbin thread and hang on to both those threads. Put a few anchoring stitches right on top of the previous ones. My thread's off to the side. Determine where I am in the formation of my leaf before I turn the motor on. And here we go.
I don't know if you saw the tip of that leaf. It has a kind of oddish shape to it. But you know what? In the scheme of things, I don't think that it will detract at all. It takes quite a bit of oddness for me to stop and undo when I'm freehanding like this. I just think it's part of the design. And you know, in nature, one leaf does not necessarily look like another. And certainly, every leaf is not perfectly formed. And so, I'm okay with that. I was talking earlier about how each person's freehand quilting particularly is as individual as handwriting. And so I should maybe clarify, the purpose of my master class is to teach you specific designs and I do walk through them step by step and how I form them, but they will still become as invi individual to you as handwriting. So my tips have much more to do with how to travel how to um, make regular shapes and how to practice to, to really advance your skill. I think that freehand quilting, for me anyway, has been my means to advancing my skill. So when I'm quilting leaves like this, for example, I will find something in that leaf to focus on that today you know I'm focusing on working on that skill so instead of just laying down leaves with no thought attached I'm working on maybe graceful s curves on the stem because I do a fair bit of custom quilting as well and I don't want to have to quilt custom quilts just to practice my skills right I want to be practicing those skills in my everyday work so that's part of my focus in the master class is how to formulate these designs, how to make your own designs from things that you see and that interest you, you know, how to make that a quiltable thing, and then how to find ways to practice elevating your skills just within your daily quilting. I don't know if it's just my perception, but it seems like the digital edged edge designs have become so much more common in the last couple of years than they used to be. Which is not a bad thing, but it is an entirely different skill and it is certainly um, a bigger price point to get into that than into this type of quilting. You can do this with a very simple machine. And we're gonna pause right there and advance the quilt just two or three inches and then we'll be able to do that last little pass. The end is in sight, folks. Last chance, fire up any questions that you have. Tell me any quilt shows I should be attending. Or even any good books I should be reading. I just read, by the way, the autobiography of Cicely Tyson. Excellent, excellent book. I highly recommend it.
And as my work as I work my way along the edge of the quilt here, you'll probably see me fitting in more partial leaves and partial shapes just to make them fit within the space. time people so what happened there is my needle actually came out it did not break believe it or not which means it's my own fault it means I didn't get it in there snugly enough when I loaded it and it worked its way loose so <laughs> Dave Dave's laughing he's laughing at me it's, can we say live and unscripted yes we can here's my trusty magnet again machine and I just keep it stuck on that bolt. I've had that magnet for a number of years and I've never lost it. So we will use our same thread slicing process. First we will pull up the bobbin thread and cut it because it is still attached at the bottom. And we're in the plaid so I think that's a reasonably good camouflage place. While I think of it, I'll just reach and cut my last two threads from the last slice. There we go. I'm just going to get my screwdriver and give it one more tighten. <laughs> now I'm nervous. That was quite a bang. I'm grateful it didn't break. stop and trim the threads because I need to quilt over that area and they will be in my way.
We are nearing the end here, which is kind of cool. Um, these live and unscripted episodes, I generally do every second week, usually on Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And most often they are an edge to edge project like this, but occasionally I will do a multi-day project for a custom quilt or something extra special. And I'd love to hear your feedback on sort of what kind of content you prefer. So feel free to take a look back over past episodes. Feel free to give me feedback on what you liked best or what you'd like to see more of. And I'll do my best to accommodate. As I said earlier, in general, I'm working on either a quilt of my own or a client quilt. So I can't always um, deliver something exactly, but I will certainly take your interests into consideration. But my goal, really, ultimately, is to help quilters, to help take the overwhelm or the intimidation out of using a long arm machine and to show how really fun it can be. So I hope that this episode has helped to do that for you. So I had a little fumble there, which you probably saw. And it just kind of happens to me as I get closer in these little tight corners. So I'm leaving the fumble. It's part of the leaf. However, I've just turned off the fast, constant speed. Just gives me a little more time to think, what am I gonna put in this little area? What am I gonna put in that one? Do I need to add an extra leaf? Is it okay as is? That sort of thing. any more questions this is your last chance to type them into the screen and we are finished a few lock stitches again within that basting line and it's all done so that is one freehand edge to edge quilt from start to finish I'm pleased so I will um, unload it today. I'll get it trimmed up for Janet. And I will take photographs so that you can see, get a better look at the quilting um, and post them either later today or tomorrow. It kind of depends on, on lighting factors as to when I can get some good photos of it. So watch on my Instagram or Facebook, Stitched by Susan in both cases, and you'll see some photographs there. Let's have some comments and or questions. Just waiting for the producer guy to get them on the screen. Kelly, is it always long arm quilting? Um, yes. I have quilted on my domestic. In fact, that's how I started quilting for clients, but it is very much a different skill. So I don't tend to practice both. Now, quite a few of these designs would be suitable for doing on a domestic machine, maybe in a slightly smaller scale. But in terms of the big picture tips, they usually have to do with the long arm, yes. Judy, I've been learning so much from you. You make it so easy. It is easy, but I'm glad you find that the videos make it seem so. 
joy and charity. I'm brand new to long arm quilting and find your videos and live so helpful. Thank you. Excellent. I'm so glad that is exactly what I hope for is that they make it reachable and doable. Debbie, this has been great. Newbie here, so very helpful. I'll be going back and watching your previous videos. Fantastic. Let me know what you think. Jill, thank you. I love watching your shows. Wonderful. And by the way, I do go back and read the comments. So even if you're watching this in a replay, feel free to ask a question or comment and I will see that and get back to you. Sue is the Omaha Quilt Show is sponsored by a local guild. Okay, good to know. And I'm just so happy to see that local guilds are getting back into gear. It looks like our local show will be happening this year as well. So I'm really, really happy to see that too. Stitched by Susan, this will be Dave typing. Just a heads up, we'll, we're moving our live and unscripted sessions to YouTube. It's a better platform for video and allows us to produce a better product. That is true. I, as far as I know, we'll still be posting them as Facebook events though, so you can still find them the same way. It will just direct you to YouTube for watching purposes. So keep an eye out for that, but they'll still be on Facebook. So thank you so much for joining me today. Once again, I am Stitched by Susan. Well, actually I'm Susan Smith, but my studio is Stitched by Susan. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. It's been fun quilting with you and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.